Hey, welcome to Hague's Business Winners. Excited to introduce Simon. I'll introduce him again when a few more people come in. In the meantime, we're we're picking some people in. But uh, Simon has an impressive 20 years of IT and project management recruitment experience to the public and private sector. And there's some really good stuff in the private sector too. Uh, he founded IT- Iteco People in 2000, uh, which is when I founded my company. And since then, has partnered with hundreds of clients to enhance their teams and help thousands of candidates to land their dream roles. I was going to say dreams and that would rhyme. I might do that next time. Thank you for the uh, brilliant introduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah all we, good today. Thank we, you. Is it Itiko people? How do I pronounce that? Itiko people. Yeah, Itiko people. You just founded that the same year I founded Hey Barrett, which was about the year 2000. And uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting some of your clients uh, over various events in London. So that's been that, that's been fantastic. Um, I want to just, uh, again, welcome everybody. This is a room that brings together leaders, industry experts, and entrepreneurs every week to share their business experience. And um, Simon, today we're going to really kind of talk about everything around recruitment, around the great resignation, how people, uh, how people have changed, one, how they recruit and hire, but at the same time, what people expect when they go to work or even work from home. So um, I know Abigail, Kurt, and Shay are on the panel with us today. Um, we're going to be um, grilling you a little bit to find out how the world of work has changed. So welcome. And and first of all, let's just start off with what brought you into this people business and uh, and how did it all start for you, Simon? Okay, well, th- thank you, Haig. Um, like a, a lot of people, um, I got into recruitment. I'd been doing other jobs uh, by knowing someone who was doing recruitment. And, you know, I love being around people and, you know, chatting, understanding what it is that they're looking for. And it seems I have a particularly good uh, knack, um, you know, for understanding what companies and clients want from the people, not only in skills, but also in cultural fit, which is really important. But but in terms of what you studied at school and stuff, did you did you ever kind of see this this type of career ahead of you or was it? did it just pop out that you I mean what what do you have to be good at to be able to have done what you've done I guess in terms of the world of recruiting okay so uh, no I mean when I went to school um, uh, you know I left at uh, A levels and uh, joined Lloyd's Bank uh, and was on their management training program for a while having done some time in high street but you know it that quickly became not for me something I wanted to do longer term so uh, I moved into working for BMW and that was my first experience in sort of like sales. And then again, it's about people skills, about understanding and listening to what people want. And in recruitment, that's absolutely key. Uh, listening skills are absolutely vital. Understanding um, a lot of empathy and getting to the bottom of exactly what people want. So that's been something that's the most important thing I feel in terms yeah, of yeah. recruitment and working with people successfully. No, brilliant. And, and, and um, so, so, again, we started our businesses at the same time. So that was the dot-com kind of revolution, wasn't it? The dot-com boom in, in 98, 99, and it crashed. I mm-hmm. think around 2000, you always had YTK going on. So yeah. was that a good time to start a business for you? Uh, was, was that well, an advantage? Well, ITCO people has been going for 20 years. Um, um, I, I'd already done a good number of years before I formed ITCO people. So in actual fact, um, uh, nearly 30 years in uh, in the whole of recruitment. So at that point, uh, the reason I set up the firm along with uh, my wife back in 2000 was that I had been working for a company. I'd been their first employee, joined, uh, you know, uh, employee number one. And together that, you know, working with the MD, and we grew that company. Um, and it became, you know, a really large recruitment outfit. And I learned a lot from him. But they were going on a particular journey that, you know, as a, you know, as a company in terms of floating, that really wasn't uh, the journey that I wanted to undertake with them uh, because the culture was changing. And so we decided right. to set up on our own. And when I first started in recruitment, it was, yeah. I mean, our, our database was, you know, in, back in 93 was a, was a book. Yeah, we faxed CVs yeah, yeah. over, you know, it was um, email was, a, a, you know, a game changer and stuff like that. So it, it, where we are now in terms of tech and what we can do so quickly is amazing. But the heart 
and I'm a firm believer in this, the heart, you cannot replace recruitment completely with technology or AI or ML. It could help, but it's not going to change the fact that you need a human interaction and interface. And that has remained solid throughout the entire process. You've got to speak to people. You've got to meet people. You've got to write throughout. You can't select, I think, just on data without having right. any form of interaction. So, so let's just jump ahead because I'm excited to kind of get to the um, great resignation kind of the last two years. And I think we'll go back and fill in some of the gaps around sure. a recruitment and, and some of the trends that we've seen in the last five years. But I guess, um, how do you see the great resignation playing out? Is it something that you could have foreseen a few years ago because people's appetite were changing? You know, did you see this coming and, and, and did COVID in a way just accelerate what was naturally going to come our way? Okay, so um, yeah, COVID has been the, a huge accelerator. Um, I believe conversations were happening um, already. Companies were having to start to address uh, remote working. Um, so I give a couple of scenarios and examples. We were working with a, a large multinational conglomerate, and they had offices in the southwest of England, and they wanted people to move to the southwest of England. And way before COVID, they were starting to look at how they could make people in the office uh, three days a week as opposed to five. But that still required people to be within easy striking distance of uh, Devon uh, to get there. When COVID happened, everybody had to work remotely. And what they have done is they've now kept that and, you know, they've really rolled with it and run, picked right. up that ball and run with it. And there's so many things that have changed uh, that we can uh, explore and you know, unpack during the course of the conversation. Next question was really about um, your first-hand experience. Now, this is, again, this is a UK clubhouse room, so we're predominantly UK, but but I was <clears> interested <throat> to know if you uh, follow any or track any changes between, like, different countries, like, you know, maybe, maybe mainland Europe, US, whether what you see happening here is, is the same trend as elsewhere. I mean, yeah, I've got to say, uh, it might... My knowledge is, is primarily uh, UK. However, I have been talking to a lot of candidates within um, uh, Europe recently for a hedge fund that we're working with. And yeah, it's similar over there that home working has, uh, be, that was brought in because of COVID has made a real big uh, difference. And it's, it's so important uh, for people now. And when we're working with clients right now, the ones who are embracing 100% remote working are, are winning the war to attract the new talent. And in terms of the context of perhaps the great resignation, the ones that aren't, the ones who are being, oh, hang on, I want you back in the office, uh, are perhaps more than is, you know, maybe even a day a week or a day a month, they, they are losing the war, in my opinion. Do you do any, and um, um, you do a lot of pre-selection, in the pre-selection, do you do any type of tests or, you know, do you ask any questions to see how suited someone is for home working versus not home working, or are you even allowed to do that? Because it's, it sounds like it might be discrimination. Um, when we're screening and selecting people, uh, we can, if, you, if the client has um, asked to do tests, uh, or psychometric tests for various things, that can be done. But, you know, it's not often... Um, picked up uh, but sorry clients don't often select to do that option and i think when you're talking to people you can get a uh, feel for whether they are going to be happy working at home just by talking with them but um you know obviously as with you know when you're hiring people on a permanent basis you know so, there is a, there are a number of uh, factors that might um, come into play during the course of the first few months from both right. sides. In, in regard to the Great Resignation, I saw an article uh, in a paper uh, the other day, and they were saying that the uh, that there's actually a rebound effect on this now. That company if people are leaving, you know, the people were leaving and going, Generation Z mainly, right. and, and actually they're finding that the grass was the same color green over there when they got there. So. It, 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 it's, it's interesting to see that play out and you know you whether someone's suitable for working at home people did make a big struggle to change and adapt to that at the start but we're two three years into this now and people adapt very quickly and they can prove and they smash the glass ceiling 
that people can be left onto their own devices and work uh, on their own in a trustworthy way. For example, there's a company that we're working with in the Midlands, and it does work in better some sectors better than others. Of course, it's going to be technology is better, but they are they they so you know you, you know you plan your day if you're going to go and do the school run. Just, just give us your work, and we're fine. We're, you know, we don't, we don't worry about whether you're going off doing a school run, what you're doing. As long as we get the work, we're happy. So that total trust from that company. But we, again, you know, we can always talk about that more at a later time. Yeah, I know they see when I first went onto Clubhouse, probably about just over a year ago. I, the casuality that's accepted now, on on just even on Clubhouse, where people will be going on their walks and jogging and they'll call in and take part in some of these rooms. You know, that casuality is, is part of it, isn't it? Like even on Zooms, uh, you know, people running around, dressing down, you know, drinking coffee, doing all sorts of things. Sometimes they get caught. But but basically, there seems to be a complete downgrade in, in formality generally. Um, and I don't know if that's being helped by that, that we are now, now mostly in, in Generation Z and why aren't we? So I don't know. Do you think some, some level of casuality has has a place now in the future? Are we going to lose a lot of the, the formal things that we used to do? I, I really believe so, uh, Haig. I mean, if I if I look at, say, on a very personal level, you know, I've grown the company, we've recruited people, we've had offices. And when we started, we we're all wearing suits and shirts and ties. And, you know, then the tie disappeared. Then the, you know, the suit's been replaced by, you know, smart casual, uh, an anecdotal story. Uh, we're working with this firm I, I mentioned earlier, a financial services firm, uh, that out of the country. As it happened, an applicant uh, applied for a job and he was on holiday in that country at the time. So we arranged for an interview and he was running around trying to get some smart trousers to wear to go to the interview because he only had a shorts. When he got yeah. to this place, the interviewer was wearing flip-flops and shorts and a T-shirt. Wow. And this is a, this is a serious, serious financial uh, services organization so yes in answer to your question brilliant well this is an exciting conversation i want to just open it up to some of the rest of the panel to abigail kurt and, and sharina or shay um i'm going to take some of their questions first anyone who wants to come up on stage and, and give a point of view or share a question to raise your hand um, kurt are you on yeah yeah I, i'll i'll just throw this out because it's i'm just curious really but um with this um, more casual style, have you noticed it uh, influencing the quality of work also? Because it seems that, you know, people dress like they don't care. Um, you know, do they care as much as they do when they were dressed up before? Or uh, I'd love your thoughts on that. Uh, hi, Kurt. Um, so here's the thing. Back in the day, uh, the city, for example, you know, it was all uh, suits and, and ties, yeah? But one company, which was at that point um, uh, Swiss Bank, I don't know if it's Swiss Bank that, that became SBC Warburg or, 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 or where it was in the journey, but they were already casually dressing uh, in the IT department for, for one. So if anyone was going for an interview, they had to put on a suit. And so, of course, it was very obvious what was going on to, to the organisation. Um, but you know this was you know in the early noughties and, and and no one could say that their work quality was being affected then fast forward we're working with this hedge fund in london you know they they've been uh, casually dressed and the, the relaxed uh, in you know nature of that has had no impact on that in fact one could say the informality has allowed taken off the constraints and their you know that that firm is a very successful very successful hedge fund so I would say no, it doesn't. And I think COVID also, you know, you know, people working remotely, what they're wearing, what they're dressing. I've seen it on Zooms, you know, the, uh, people are very casual and they don't judge now at all. And people's work quality is absolutely fine. And one could say maybe even slightly better. Oh, thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you, Kurt. And uh, again, we've got a couple of people with raised hands. Let's see if we can bring them up. Um, I wanted just to ask you a question while, while we're just sorting out the, the next couple of questions. Hopefully, Shay and Abigail are, are going to be able to talk soon. But um, personal branding, to what extent, um, Simon, do you 
help anybody who, who's kind of that you're trying to get into companies around their personal brand and to, and to what extent over the last five ten years has social media kind of activity um made a difference to how you select candidates or um is that something you look at to look at their social media history does that matter but generally is personal branding something that you think is important for somebody to do nowadays to compete for a, a top job uh hey yeah i mean it, it's really it's really important so some of the stuff that i do on uh, you know it, to help people uh, start out and work is I'll go to schools, sixth form colleges. Uh, I might work uh, with uh, apprentice schemes to give them some advice on what how they might go about getting a job when they leave. And one of the points that I'm always covering is social media. Yes, companies will always look at uh, potential candidates, social media. Even before social media happened, they looked at, say, for example, uh, in the interest and hobby section of a CV. And... Uh, you know, they're, they're looking for what they, you know, uh, they're looking for maybe a team interest type thing and maybe trying to see if someone's a, you know, collaborator. But maybe if someone just sits there and says, I just like to stay at home and read books, they might be thinking, oh, how well, you know, what's their team skills, for example. Um, so, yes, personal branding is very important. Social media is uh, a, a real uh, concern, uh, or not concern rather, but it's something that candidates should be making sure then the job hunting is representing them uh, you know, and thinking about how uh, some posts might be perceived and received. And certainly uh, companies make a great deal of effort to look at that as part of their selection process. Thanks, Simon. Um, I've got Abigail's question next. I'm going to jump onto that. And then maybe after you speak, Abigail, could you reset the room? Yeah. Hi, Simon. Um, I absolutely love this conversation. And so my question is going to be a bit left field, but I have been um, in the, the sort of the business of working with recruitment companies for maybe the last 15 years pri prior to starting uh, doing what I do now. And I always work with the recruitment companies in a certain way. So I'm just wondering how your way of working has changed in so far as now you're having to work with the organizations to help them to understand the requirements of the current talent and then work with the current talent to help them understand the requirements of the organizations. It's almost like your role as a recruiter has become more of a coaching role as well as sort of client facing on two different sides. So I wonder if you can speak into what it is that you have actually found yourself doing in this whole great resignation reshuffle um, climate that we find ourselves in yeah that's um, I'm very happy to go into that Abigail nice to, to, to talk to you um, okay so if I miss anything out then obviously let's please come back let me know and we'll come back to, to points but I'm working with a client now in London and they before COVID they were doing two days a week from home. Now, this is a large organization, two and a half thousand users, uh, some uh, frontline services, i.e. they have some people that need to interact with the customers in their homes or uh, their offices, for example. So those people are different than perhaps the area that I'm talking about, which is maybe more the corporate office, IT, uh, which can theoretically be done uh, you know, better from home, or sorry, as well uh, from home. Now they're struggling to recruit because they've now, with COVID, they went fully remote and they're now trying to get people back into the office two days a week, going maybe to three again. And they are struggling to recruit because candidates don't want that. So I'm trying to educate them about that and also the fact that one of the things that's happening in the Great Resignation is an uplift in salaries to, t to coach them on that. So that journey is very hard because if the board, you know, it's because it goes, it's not necessarily at the tactical level at the line management level, it's all the way up to the board and the board's got to lead and drive on this. And that, and that's, a, that's sometimes pushing a, it's, a, it's almost like a syphysis putting, pushing the ball up the hill relentlessly. And it just goes back down to the bottom again. You've got to start that conversation again. So then, then you've got the candidates. Now the candidates have recently had it all. Um, they've been working from home, uh, they've been paid the, the, the same, they're suddenly finding, certainly in IT, as people go back, 
I think one of the reasons in IT uh, that it's a big demand of an explosion in, in requirement skill, a couple of areas, cyber security, for example, uh, increased attacks on companies, um, infrastructure uh, and security setups. So they need these skills. Uh, obviously, COVID has accelerated people working from home. So suddenly they've got all the right working. And now all the, the, the big explosion in cloud uh, compute, you know, cloud enabled working, and they want to build out that. But it's instead of it being in a natural way, companies sort of doing it, you know, different times, they all seem to be doing it the same cycle. This has pushed up salaries. This means uh, candidates are sort of thinking, well, hey, I can get a big pay rise here. And potentially they can, but it's moderating their, uh, you know, their expectations, understanding that in actual fact, there has to be a balance struck. So yes, you want to facilitate it all, and some candidates are open and understand and listen. Others are sort of sticking to their guns, going, "No, I want to rise, and I want to carry on working 100 percent of the time from home." Yeah. So, like I say, you have a very, very interesting role. <laughs> Trying to manage the expectations on both sides must mean that sometimes you are really out of your own comfort zone. Um, so, I just I find the whole subject absolutely fascinating, and I'm really pleased that we're having this conversation today. So, if you are here with us today, you are in Hague's Business Winners Club. Um, this room runs every single Thursday from one till two, and Hague is bringing in guests from around the world, talking about subjects that are current and challenging us. And we would absolutely love to keep bringing guests and conversations to this room. So if there's anything you would like to be spoken about in future rooms, then reach out. If you've got any questions after this room, then also reach out. And um, I will hand the mic back to Haig. And don't forget to join the club so that you find out what's going on. Hit the greenhouse at the top to do that. And if you resonate with anything anybody said, obviously click on their face and you can follow them on social media. And we've also pinned the link to Simon at the top of the room so you can connect with him on LinkedIn as well. I'll hand the mic back to Haig. Great. Thank you, Abigail. And, um, and again, today we're talking with Simon Dunscombe, all about the new world of work and how it's changed. We're talking about the great resignation, how important it is for um, a lot of people in the job market to to upgrade their kind of personal branding to a point that you probably wouldn't have needed to do five, ten years ago. And um, we're talking about how, um, actually Simon was saying, how the glass ceiling for working from home has been shattered and so many companies now are quite open to to having people work from home. And in fact, he went as far as saying that if the companies that are not accepting the fact that people can work from home are the ones that are going to uh, lose a lot of good people and get left behind. So flash your mics if you have a question. I want to welcome Brian to the stage. Brian, uh, do you have a comment or a question? I can uh, squeeze you in now or I can, um, I, I can wait till later. I'll come if you like. Can you Absolutely. hear me now? Yeah, it's a great time to... Have well, you joined? Of course, I met Simon through you, Brian, many, yeah. many years ago. So, so thank you for the introduction. You know, um, this is so valuable because how many um, job conferences are you actually hearing are set up to be able to talk about this? I mean, if you actually just look at the recent history and all this sort of unintended consequences of where we are today, you know, you've seen pensions reduced, employers have reduced um, some of the loyalty features and allowed people to disappear and then they wonder now how on earth they can get some of the big brands how they can get business employees have a choice they can actually go very easily and um, I think it's probably helpful if I I mean I've made so many notes off the things that have triggered with what Simon has been saying that I do think before I forget it I think this subject, I've actually been casting around recently through the clubhouses to just to see how many people are actually talking about this subject. But if you go into every single industry, everybody's short of people. And now if you look at the other side of the coin, if you have to be an employer, and I'm kind of an employer as well of a company with about an organization with about 1200 people. And for the last eight months, we've changed the whole way uh, in which we actually try to bring people on board. And in fact, it's resulted in two, uh, almost three, logging salary increases. Um, 
topic totally unforecast and uh, unbudgeted for, and that's several millions of quid. Um, and what you do is you introduce things that uh, introduced it today. We introduced the thousand pound retention fee um, four or five months ago. Jolly expensive. So uh, if you actually introduce somebody, you'll get a uh, um, you, you, you'll get an introduction fee of five hundred quid, and the individual gets a retention fee of a thousand quid. And so we're all having to think as employers quite quite differently. And this subject is not going to easily change for the next few years. It's going to be absolutely um, critical to every single employer. And under CPI is yesterday 7% and of course CPI mortgage um, increases or a mortgage rates that people have so you have to look at the old style when you have a high inflation you actually have to look at RPI and RPI is running at nearly 9% that's really serious stuff for employers for employees as well in a sense in a funny sort of way because they've got demand costs they're wanting a pay increase all the time so we are in a really strange time in all the type of forecasting and I thought back to a case to a clubhouse about six months ago with William Manick who is one of uh, Haig's uh, clubhouse star performers and uh, he was talking he got it right on the button about the way that we've got to every single reforecasting that we're doing is probably almost on a monthly basis and why is it is because there's a shortage of skills um, and, and it's not just at the top table uh, every single level you are actually making changes to your mindset to say what can I do to keep you here uh, you can't leave you used to be able to do it to just say the board level you know the, the headhunters used to sort of say well I, I want you to come and join this company as a financial director and uh, the company will pay you another 100,000 quid a year or whatever. But now it's everywhere. It's right the way down the line to the very basic skill. And I think I'd love to see this Hague almost come up as a subject title almost once a month because it ain't going away. This is the most important issue that employers and individual employees. And then we can go into the other peripheries like um, what you know the company dynamic uh, DNA do, John Tarrant's company who is a very successful business because he's doing the branding of recruitment advertising. And he got involved in a company that I was involved with a long time ago um, when uh, we set up a recruitment company and turned it into a, seven, a 42 million pound turnover company in seven years. And one of the novel things he did was recruiting. We were recruiting for Formula One Honda. And what uh, he managed to do was to actually um, create sort of using FaceTime um, sort of little modules where people do an introduction over the over the phone for three over the face over the um, web for three minutes um, and uh, that way you're able to get sort of 4,000 applicants right down to about you know sort of uh, what they were recruiting about 80 at the time and so there's those novel ways of actually how you actually work the system to get it more efficient down sort of has a good good idea of so I, I mean almost everything that that you've said and you haven't touched the power of LinkedIn even for quite basic jobs now and where LinkedIn goes how do you attract people like me sit how do I attract people to help the organization get better more quickly and we can't grow anymore at this moment in time because we ain't got enough people so, you know, I think we've touched a lot of subjects in there and, and I just um, offer it to, the, to, to, to everybody on the basis that this right. subject ain't going away and we're going to be talking about it for a long time. Okay. So, yeah, thank you, Brian. Yeah, there was a lot to unpack in, in that. Uh, Simon is miraculously going to pull out a couple of mega uh, golden bites out of that. But um, yeah, the thing for me is, I guess, there's been a lot of shifts in the 30 years I've been in the workforce in a lot of new recruitment firms, you know, jumping out of nowhere and suddenly doing some huge, um, huge revenues like the one you mentioned, uh, Brian, I got to 42 million pounds, you know, rather quickly. 
Um, and there's been different models with um, the very traditional firms, the ones that are more high tech, ones that are less high tech. Um, I don't know, Simon, what do you think is, is, is going to happen in the next five years in terms of who are going to be the survivors or not the non-survivors of... Uh, Gosh, that's a, uh, yes, that, that's a big question. Dollar and, question there, um, yeah. And you may not want to give it away yeah. because if you've got a secret and you want to be the $40 billion gorilla soon, yeah. then you may not want to give your secrets away. Well, that, that's interesting because that, that could cover up the fact that I might not have an answer. Uh, but no, that, what, what I feel is that the companies have got to... We're on a, we are in unprecedented times. Not only have we got uh, the coming out of the COVID thing, uh, but we're clearly another thing that hasn't been mentioned is that um, the, the war in Ukraine really has um, you know put a, a pin in uh, the balloon that is globalization and a global workforce. I've spoken to a number of people whose companies all of a sudden they're people they can't you know the, the people in Belarus they have people in Belarus they're not. They're not being able to do work. Companies that had connections with Russian software developers, these, that's that's really added to it as well, and added to the demand. So, yeah, that that's not going to help matters. But companies that can strike that balance uh, and, and engage with the workforce into all candidate pool, and also work on their retention and develop uh, people. I I was looking at an article just now, uh, and how you know getting people in on board into the culture been really challenging through um uh, covid and the companies have started to get the ones that are getting that right that's the retention the keeping the staff is just as important as getting the staff um and how you can collaborate you know work collaboratively using technology such as slack but you know i'm a firm believer that you just absolutely cannot lose the human uh the human interaction in, in that process uh abigail was talking uh, about setting candidate expectations and being that mediator as much as i like to feel that um you know you, you know you want to get everything that a candidate wants we do have to manage expectations and i do think you get something from being in the office so i think candidates also know, need to start thinking actually i am gonna have to go into the office it should perhaps be not as much as the employer might want, but I should be willing and happy to go in maybe more frequently than I would ideally like to. So lots of things there. Um, I don't know if Brian wanted to pick up on a, a separate answer uh, as well, separately to that. Thank you, Simon. Um, yeah, we, we'll, we'll come back to Brian. I know Shay's been waiting to ask his question and I don't see Brian flashing. So let's just um, take what you've said and I want to go to Shay, and I think last week we worked out Shay was a Gen Y. Were you a Gen Y? We were trying to work out if he was Gen Z, Gen Y, Gen X, or Gen Double Y. But, but you're Gen Y. Gen so. X, actually. <laughs> hi, hi, just making sure you can all hear me properly. Apologies, um, some technical issues. So um, I think the Wi-Fi dropped when I was speaking. But um, no, Simon, fantastic room. I'm loving this conversation. And um, I was really just on about um, how the COVID era really fast track the concept of remote working um so my background is obviously oil and gas and this is something that is known because we're trying to drive down um unnecessary health and safety risks or exposure to any incidents happening so a lot of remote working takes place and we try to do a lot you know across multiple regions using video conferencing and so on and so forth um now uh, you know my, my my question really is um is this really here to stay um how much value is realized from people working remotely? Um, is hybrid working the right way to go? Um, also, in terms of um, bringing people to work for organizations, you know, how much influence does it have with the ability to remote work? You know, on your CV, should I say, is that a good thing to say? Is this something you should talk about? Um, also, you know, saying you live in different regions but you're happy to work remotely, is that a good thing? Um, I'm just wondering for those who are looking to get into careers now, what what are they really looking for? You know, also the the concept of IT skills, how. How much does that influence your CV or your opportunity to work for a company in this day and age? You know, because I strongly believe IT is taking over. Um, the, I think the new types of people companies want must have a certain level of IT competence. You know, how true is that? I just want to know what your thoughts are around that, Simon. Uh, well, hi, Shay. Uh, it, it's great to talk to you. Um, and again, there's, there's a, a large number of uh, things to cover there. So, um, yeah, IT skills are really important. 
but I think people, um, as each generation comes through, or they're they get they're, they're just born with the technology, so they just grab it and they run with it so much easier. You, you know, when I was a kid, video recorders were first introduced. My parents couldn't figure out how to program it. It was down to me. And I'm now asking my uh, 23 year old daughter, how can I do certain things on apps on phones? So it, it's always happening. So the, the, the younger people as they come through have better IT skills. So it, it, it all na naturally happens that way. In terms of, uh, you know, how people should uh, present where they're located to, to uh, clients and how they should be uh, advertising or, or, or describing what they're prepared to do. I think that's very important. Um, and there's a whole different conversation around CV or, uh, you know, what you put in a CV and all that sort of thing. And I'm a, you know, that's that. It is an entirely separate conversation. But certainly you need to be tailoring each application to each company, uh, uh, showing that you've done your research. And of course, then you can, if it fits with what you want as an applicant, i.e. this company is based in London, I live in Bristol, I'm very happy to go to London on X amount of days per time period, then you can make that clear to them because the, if there's going to be an absolute disconnect with what the company wants and what the client, uh, the candidate is expecting, you know, it's only going to break, break down. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of things there, Shay. It, it, what else is there particularly? Because there's quite a few questions in your original comment. Would you want me to address? No, I, I, think, I think that was really about it. I was just more after people understanding like, the importance of tailoring your CV to the particular opportunities and obviously highlighting the strengths, you know, in relation to the opportunity you might be chasing. And of course, you know, also, you know, mentioning your IT competences, because, um, you know, from what we see, I think, you know, it's, it's very important to have the ability to use various tools out there, you know, and it's constantly evolving, you know, like, like now, you know, we're talking video conferencing, but we're talking, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot happening in the, in the, in the world around web 3.0, which is the hybrid behind um, virtual reality and the uh, video conferencing, you know, and bringing that on play, you know, and some companies already use this to handle various um, preventive um, maintenance, we call it in oil and gas space, where you have video reality solutions, you know, doing analysis of various fields to see what's happening and sort of protect damages from happening today in basic terms um so yes yeah, so i just really wanted to just just highlight and i think you did you did touch on it pretty well so thank you so much you're welcome but uh, uh, cvs uh, it's, it is a huge topic all, all in of its own um but in short i really do think that tailoring and it, it is very important and i almost look at it as you don't need one cv you, you sort of like you don't have one golf club you have a golf bag and in there you've got all your golf clubs and I think that's something that you, you, how you should approach your CV. You should probably almost have like nine versions of it. And then it's probably easy to cust is much easier and less time consuming to customize one of those nine for the exact job rather than having to do it all from the start each time. And yes, you really have to emphasize the IT skills. They are looking for these either, you know, are you a Microsoft stack person? Do you know all the Microsoft um, 365 products? Are you good with them? Or are you a Google Cloud person? You're an Apple person. What you know? They do want to see that, and you, yes, you definitely need to be including that. If you're listening and you don't have that in there, get it in there. And even yeah, thanks, Simon. I think even the CV is kind of out of date in a way because I know when I did some recruiting. I mean, again, it depends on the industry, and it depends what kind of skill set you need. But I remember I would, you know, troll through people's social media, and especially now that so much is done on Zoom, I can't help thinking that. Uh, how somebody presents themselves on a on a camera it becomes critical because even though you know we're in the engineering sector in, in many cases our clients um, if I'm going to watch somebody on a screen for for three hours a week then obviously if they're not very good at getting their point across I think it, it makes things a lot harder because you've got a lot less of the um, water cooler discussions or again if you if you're looking at an engineering environment that we often are somebody might be outside someone's office talking and that person might be very natural and he can open up a, pic a picture or a drawing or he can open up, you know, um, something and show somebody. Um, to do that whole effect, in my opinion, in Zoom, you know, it's a bit more of a magician's act to, to keep people engaged, you know, to, to put up the right, you know, the right um, schematic at the right time and make sure people are looking at it because you have no control. I mean, you just end up with these tiny little faces 
Um, you can't point as easily to things. So I don't know. Um, I think the CV, in a way, is kind of out of date. And in, and in some cases, you probably want people to um, I don't know, be on a podcast for, for 20 minutes. Or I know with, with senior level, C-level executives, um, the, the podcasts that I've done are, in some cases, a great you know, 35-minute um, summary of their lives, credentials, philosophies, what they believe in culture. Um, so there might be an opportunity for, for, for you to uh, introduce something like that. Simon, where you, you do a 20 minute interview. I don't know if you looked at that. I know some people were using video to do interviews, but you could do video clips like you would get normally with an actress or something like that. Uh, yeah. Hey, um, we work, uh, with a client, say for example, that, um, you know, has asked for a little three minute video that, you know, they're not, they're not looking for Steven Spielberg production values, but you know, even if it's just a three minute, uh, a clip filmed on your phone in the car, that's absolutely fine. You know, our systems now, uh, we're geared up to do video interviews so we could ask some pre-screened questions, uh, sorry, pre-programmed questions to put into the screening progress process for candidates and clients. We can do that. And in fact, I was um, with a can talking with a candidate the other day and yes, they still had a resume. And the resume, I'm sure you're right, it will it will go, uh, perhaps not become as quite as important, but I don't think it's going to go-go. But the candidate that I was talking to had an absolutely fabulous personal website. So you talk about that personal branding. It, it's, the, it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen as a candidate. And, you know, that person's almost guaranteed to get um, a, an interview each, uh, each time on the basis of what they've got there. It's so impressive. And their personal branding, absolutely uh, spot on. Very, very important. So, yeah, I don't think the CV is going anywhere too fast but it, it will it will evolve again great stuff thanks simon uh, brian did you have a, a well comment? i think he's right about um personal branding i think you're right simon uh, and um you know i think uh, i tell quite a lot of who uh, who are quite who are, you know postgraduate or just just you know going through university and they want some work experience actually to get onto linkedin and that, that's a good way of personal branding. And I think looking at it from an employer's point of view, I think employers are having to learn how to differentiate as well. Um, and then the other bit that we've not touched on, Simon, you might have a view, is um, that to be, there are new two bits that I think. I think managers need to learn how to manage this new type of workforce that they have in the virtual world. And uh, and then the other bit is is that they um, I've lost the thread of that one. But I think it is about you know we have we we've got a big job in trying to retrain people's mindsets as to how to uh, win the hearts and minds to get people to apply uh, because there's a shortage of skills and that's the point that's the problem. How where are they going to come from? So employers have got a big job trying to sell in a different way. Uh, yeah, I think you're you're right, Brian. I mean, LinkedIn, it's, it, you know, it, you've, you've all seen how it's evolved. Mm. And um, I learned something just the other day, just today, actually, I saw Ab Abigail's um, LinkedIn profile, and there's a profile picture, but actually, it's a video there as well. And that's, really, I've not seen that before. I mean, if it's been out there for ages, I'm going to show some ignorance there. So, but I'm, I was really impressed with that. Yeah. And that's a neat little thing. But for candidate experience, because LinkedIn, when they were bought by Microsoft, yeah. trying to monetize it, they are really selling these LinkedIn messages to recruiters. Yeah. So what candidates are getting, are, instead of getting a lot of, they used to get phone calls, you know, inundated with phone calls, they used to get inundated with emails, they're now getting inundated with LinkedIn messages. It's becoming white noise. So um, it, it, it's a great showcase for candidates. And I think that, again, this is something that we can pick up at, at another time. There's a huge, I could, I could talk, 20 minutes about what I think candidates should do with uh, their LinkedIn profiles. Mm. Um, but it, it's not the silver that's bullet a, to, re to recruitment. Yeah, that's, that's a great topic, actually. At, at some point, we should come back to that. Uh, the, the, other point, yeah, the, the other point I, I have remembered um, for Simon is, is the change in the use of psychometrics, the, the re-emergence of psychometrics. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just, just 
remembered, I, you know, I was involved in a, in a program of uh, a high level of recruitment just earlier this year. And uh, it's interesting, you know, if, if you've got a common psychometric that you tend to use, that's easy to do to bring out personality profile or whatever. That helps in addition to somebody being able to do do an interview over fa FaceTime. If you've got their psycho, um, you can immediately sort of see if they're a, for whatever person, personality and work profile they're, they're they're used to. So I think psychometrics has still got a, has got a part to be used a lot. It's sort of waned a lot recently, but I think that's a part. What do you think, Simon? Do you think? Yeah, I think it, it's a very useful tool. Um, I think it will become. If, if you're in this hybrid world of work, hybrid work world going forward, uh, you know, a lot of interviews well, for two years, people were being interviewed purely by Teams or, or Zoom or Skype. Mm. And now they're doing first interviews over that and bringing people in for a face to face interview. It's, again, it's sort of evolving. But I think that if you are recruitment is going to be so important that it sh any tool that you can use to give you another data point to put into your decision making process, so that it's right for the candidate yeah. and the client together because a, a good hire is great but a bad hire costs so much more in terms of time cost and money for everyone and, and sometimes you know if the, if the wrong person goes into the wrong job it's uh it's unpleasant for the candidate it's not a good experience so yeah i think it is and they're getting you know more cost effect you know more cost effective for clients so it needs to be quite expensive they're now becoming more manageable yeah. So, yeah, as long as you don't make it onerous for candidates, mm. as long as it's not a massively long task, because, you know, life is busy these days, right? And that's something companies have got to manage. You're right. You mentioned about people managing people remotely. Very, very important because you can get people working too long. They need to take step away from their work desk. And yeah. if their work desk is in the house, that does become, a, you know, in the old days, you have a bad day at the office, you get in the car, you drive home or you get on the train and go home, whatever, you had that shut cool down time. Well, yeah. if you have your, in the office, you have that bad argument, you leave the office and then you go home and it's one second later, that clouds followed you into your personal life. So it's very important that, that you know, this is all well, got well, to be. Yeah, and unfortunately that works both ways. If someone's having a bad day at home, not that anyone in this room would ever have that, but but uh, it it means if you're working at home and you're having a bad day at home, then you're kind of stuck there as well without a change of scene. And I think that's that's a problem. I think in the long term for people when they say, "Oh, it's fine, I can do the job from home," um, because people go through cycles and kids are at different ages and relationships go through ups and downs. You know what I mean? So I think. Even if some some people are moving, uh, for example, and you're in your packing boxes, you're going to move in two weeks. That that work environment doesn't really kind of suit suit you then to, to spend eight hours on Zoom if you're sitting on boxes and you haven't moved yet. So I think uh, longer term, I think it's a tough one. Um, I I, uh, I I I enjoy the question about psychometric testing because it's something Abigail had put in the chat here, which I was going to bring up if Brian hadn't. So. 10 points to Brian for bringing that up. Um, in terms of psychometric tests, uh, we're running out of time, but I was just going to ask you, Simon, um, are there a couple that you like? I think Abigail was asking, you know, at the time there was there was DISC and all these other ones. We use Insights. I use Marjorie and McCann with my executive teams. Um, is, there, is there a couple that you rate highly? Are there new ones that have come in? Um, or is it the, the same old Myers-Briggs and all the rest of it? Uh, in, in short, hey, I'm going to say that the the older one, the old ones, are, are the good ones as ever. Um, I was actually looking at one for uh, not a. It shouldn't be just done on cost, but it was a, it was a more accessible cost for smaller companies. And uh, I was talking about their psychometric test because they offered lots and lots of tests. This is online, so they can deliver it online, and it's it's you know therefore uh, more easy, much more easily yeah. accessible. And they they were saying, look, our stuff is you know it's not the best, it's not the, it's definitely not the low, you know worst tests that are out there, but they give a good indication, uh, and I think that's something that's just got to be accessible for the you know the companies that haven't got that big budget to spend on really expensive tests. But um, yeah, they're, they're very they're they've definitely got to be in the process, and I, I think they've got a very important pl place in the, the hiring process for the right role. I was blown away uh, by one of my clients who's really into these tests. He found a couple of different ones, which uh, one of them I remember is the Gallup one, right, where you've got these different categories. Um, 
by Marcus Buckingham. There's a book there, and I think you buy the book for fifty pounds. You can do the test. Um, we did that for one of the team of executives that we had, and again, it was just a fantastic way to get the room to mix and talk and and understand each other. And and that's relatively cheap, obviously, because it's just the price of a book. And there was another one that was free that had I think four different categories. And again. Knowing the executive team uh, intimately, uh, it was just so accurate for something that was free. And again, it, it, it led to such great conversations for people to see if they were a pleaser or a rebel. Again, I can't remember the name, and, um, and I should, but, but it's a fantastic test, and it was free. Um, but, but again, it was a, a delight to use. Mm. And other tests, of course, could be quite specific, quite technical, for example, and you can buy test credits that are really quite cheap, including psychometric, for example. So, yeah, you're right. Um, that They do have an important part. So, um, Simon, it's been absolutely fantastic. Um, I don't know if Abigail's around to, to help wrap up the room because I, I saw Kev has left again uh, with his family issues. But I just want to say what a fantastic session it was today. Um, thank you for coming on, Simon. I know you're not spending a lot of time on Clubhouse. So uh, you, you, you dived in fearlessly and have been a great guest. And uh, and thanks to all my business winners, Abigail, uh, Kurt, Simon, Brian, Sharina, for coming on stage and for everybody listening, Sigawa in the audience and Daryl and Rita, Christophe, Simone, and everyone else in the audience being fantastic. We will have a summary of this session, which will be available on my Instagram and LinkedIn pages very soon. So if you're not following me there, or my link tree, please follow me. Next week, it's Easter, it's a holiday. Uh, Abigail, did you want to do a, a little wrap uh, as, as the uh, the mod, stand-in super mod? Um, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been so amazing. If you're live or you've been listening on the replay, then welcome to Hague's Business Winners Club. Um, and every week, Hague runs this room, except we are not running it next week because we're having a little holiday so thank you simon thank you everybody for uh, your insight and your wisdom it has been an amazing conversation here today so i will hand the mic back to Haig. so unless simon uh, again thank you any final comments hey hey abigail uh, and everyone i just want to say thank you very much for uh, having me on the clubhouse it's been really good um and uh yeah i look forward to talking to you with you again on one and if you want you know where i am please ask i'll be more than happy to join you thank you thank you again simon thank you everybody and uh until next week goodbye take well until two weeks time uh goodbye and take care see you bye all right thank you bye-bye bye-bye thank you simon bye